Dear Arthur. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a lot of things. It can be dramatic or funny or sad. It has elements of a western or action or even thriller. But one thing that it's never really described as is a love story. Of course, there's the gang and their familial love for each other. There's Beau Gray and Penelope Braithwaite, the star-crossed lovers a la Romeo and Juliet. And of course, there's John and Abigail, whose love and relationship may be the single strongest thread tying the entire narrative together. But the one love story that perhaps goes a little overlooked is that of Arthur Morgan and Mary Linton, former lovers who, despite their instincts, simply cannot be together. And it's perhaps one of the most realistic portrayals of lost love I've ever seen. This is Red Dead Redemption 2's most heartbreaking love story. Special thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I know I talk a lot about the actual Wild West, but the internet is its own Wild West, with websites always trying to capture their own bounties. Their bounties, of course, being your private data. Well, with NordVPN, you can feel at peace knowing that you have secure access to the internet and can keep your online identity private. And with NordVPN's newest feature, Threat Protection, you can ensure that your online browsing is always safe, keeping you protected from trackers, malware, and ads. And of course, with over 5,500 NordVPN servers in 60 countries, you can enjoy a fast and stable connection anywhere you go, and access websites that are otherwise inaccessible. A true godsend for a foreigner trying to research and access American history. If you're interested in finding out more, NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect yourself and support the channel by heading over to NordVPN and getting an exclusive deal. Check out the link in the description to find out more. And thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I've written this letter a hundred times or more and I cannot get it right. From the very first line of her letter, Mary still clearly cares about Arthur and cares about his opinion of her. And despite it being years since their last meeting, she's still very sweet and personable with him. You know it's me from the bad handwriting. When they meet, things seem a little awkward, and we see Arthur act in a way that we've never really seen him act before. He's nervous and uncomfortable, even a little submissive. When he finds out that Mary just wants his help, he clearly holds some resentment. I'll owe you. You already owe me. Yet he helps her anyway. But he knows where this is going, so after helping her with Jamie, he refuses so much as a handshake and prompts her to leave instead. It's good to see you, Mary. And you, Arthur. And you. As Mary gets on the train, she stops. She wants to say something, to compliment Arthur, to ask him to come with her perhaps, until she comes back to reality and realizes that Arthur is who he is. I've... you're... Oh, you'll never change. I know that. And in a way that we've not seen until this point, Arthur is hurt by this. Her words go straight to his core, and his heart breaks knowing that he cannot get what he so simply desires. This isn't uncommon in relationships, especially recently ended ones. There are often still emotions there, and in moments of weakness, the offending party may want to go back to those moments of comfort before remembering that there was a reason they left in the first place, like Mary does here. And for the party perhaps still in love, they may be willing to do whatever, if not for a chance at love again, perhaps only to see them again, spend time with them, or even just to make them happy. And despite knowing that it's probably not the right thing to do, I trust I will not make a god-awful fool of myself once more. They'd likely do it again all the same. Somehow I imagine I shall. My dear Arthur. Mary's second letter to Arthur immediately makes her feelings even clearer than before. She holds Arthur in high regard, romantically or otherwise. Why couldn't you change? and be a man and put down all those fantasies that shroud your judgment. She's basically telling Arthur here, with very little secret or fanfare, that she still would have stayed with him if he'd have left the outlaw lifestyle behind. Life is very confusing, and I see now that I'm not very good at it. This is a very common mindset for people who are undergoing transitions in their life. They reconsider old flames and friends, and whether things could have gone differently at some point. If they're still in the same social bubble, they cling to them, even though perhaps they shouldn't, because there is a quiet comfort in sharing moments with them. Perhaps it brings them back to a happier time, when they're in a better place with the people around them. Or perhaps it's just a familiarity that they cling to, thoughts of a time where things weren't changing and they weren't going through anxiety-inducing life events. 
I beg of you, even though I am ashamed to do so. Mary is self-aware enough to understand the potential ridiculousness of her proposal, but is desperate and perhaps even confused enough to ask it anyway, if only to see Arthur again. Arthur makes no secret, at least to the player, that he is still trying to impress Mary in some way. In fact, to an extent, he doesn't really make his feelings a secret to Mary either. You came. Sure. Whenever you call for me, I'll come. Before long though, the argument demonstrates their history and why they're unable to truly be together, not to mention the fantastic performances of Roger Clark and Julie Jesnick. Oh, I know. You had to live by your code. But your code is... Well, it's not right. Has your way been right, Mary? With you? And Jamie joining a bunch of crazies? And hypocritical daddy with his drinking and horn and gambling? Huh? Is that what a pure life has gotten you? Begging me for help? Arthur is too unwilling to change his ways in order to be with Mary, and Mary is too unwilling to follow her own heart instead of her family's to be with him. Or, you know, in better words... It wasn't that I didn't love you, Arthur. That basically summarizes all of it. Think how different life could have been. Yeah, I think about it. A lot. Clearly the love between them is still there. They both quietly wish that life could have gone differently and they could have been together despite both being unwilling to change enough to do so. Oh, Arthur, I should have ran away with you years ago. And here, Mary says up front what she's been thinking the whole time. In a moment of weakness, she admits what her heart truly desires, but not before she clears her mind a little and moves on her way. But, well, I don't know. In the gameplay sequence that follows, there's still clearly some tension between the two, made obvious when they're forced to get close to each other, and you can feel Arthur's heartbeat intensifying through the vibrations of the controller, as if his heart is beating out of his chest. After Arthur completes the errand for Mary, as she's considering her life and her family, she appears upset and vulnerable, even more so than normal, so she asks Arthur to go to the theatre with her. Oh, I've missed you. Don't start. You're an idiot, but you'll always be my friend. Perhaps this is Mary trying to gain control of the situation, realizing that the two are better off as friends and setting Arthur's expectations for the date ahead. Just two friends having a good time. You're not a very nice woman, Mrs. <laughs> Lamb. Well, look at the company I keep. I know, it's quite dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> the quick banter between them shows their natural affection for each other and the immediacy with which they can make each other laugh shows their familiarity. They have history, and they work together, even if it's not to the extent necessary for a life partnership. After the theatre, Arthur walks Mary to the trolley station, where they have their last ever conversation. My life wasn't supposed to... I've always wondered where this sentence was supposed to go. Is she concerned that, with the death of her husband, she might end up alone? Is she questioning her decision to leave Arthur in the first place all those years ago? Clearly, in addition to all her other emotions, her date with Arthur is adding to her confusion. Perhaps after she moved away from Arthur, Mary had mapped out her life with her husband, and after his death, these plans were unraveled. She's in a place of confusion, of grief, and is portrayed so realistically. Making life plans with a person, and then losing it all unexpectedly, is unsurprisingly tough, and in some cases, the aftermath and depression from dealing with that change of plans may outlast the heartbreak from the original breakup or death in the first place. Losing someone that you're close to, in love with most of the time, is incredibly difficult, but if that isn't hard enough, having to restructure your entire life, where you live, what you do, who you speak to, is a constant reminder of that pain, perhaps of losing the other person, or perhaps simply a reminder that you were so dependent on that person that you never really had an opportunity to live your life for yourself. Perhaps Mary's confusion and vulnerability is a result of this constant reminder. Mary asks Arthur if there's still a chance for them to be together. Oh, is it too late for us, Arthur? And Arthur, the surprisingly honest man that he is, warns her that he doesn't want her involved in his crimes. I can't lie to you. I'm a wanted man, Mary, if I... If anyone close to me, well, they wanted to, and I can't have you wrapped up in that. I think, as Arthur says this, Mary is hearing what she doesn't want to hear. 
She wants Arthur to tell her that no, it isn't too late for them. They can run away together right here and right now. So she gives him one final chance, one last plea to drop everything and go with her. Run away with me, Arthur. Run away right now and don't look back. And Arthur gets that rare vulnerability in his own voice, and you can hear how much he wants this. I want to. More than anything I want to. But you know he can't. He knows he can't. And as he continues to explain, Mary knows he can't. And you can visibly see the dream disappear from her face. You can see her snap back into the reality of the situation, because they can never be together. And she knew that a long time ago. So, she admits defeat. I know you won't run away. And in this moment, it feels like Mary finally pulls away for the last time, as she literally walks away from Arthur. But it's a pretty dream. And she knows that's all it is, a dream. Arthur cannot leave his family for her, despite that, in this moment, she finally seemed willing to walk away from hers for him. Look at Mary's face as Arthur tries to explain his financial situation, pleading his case to her. She's given up, finally, once and for all, coming to terms with the fact that, at least for the foreseeable future, she would never be Arthur's number one priority, and her dream of running away was just that, a dream. I'll write you. To me, it seems that Mary has already started writing this letter in her head, explaining her reasoning and setting it all out for Arthur for the last time. She just needs time to confirm it for herself and put it into words, but her mind is all made up. And with that, she looks back at Arthur one final time, admitting defeat and looking heartbroken, and the trolley rides away, and she'll never see him again. I don't imagine you'll receive this letter, but I nonetheless must send it. This final letter perfectly summarizes why Arthur and Mary will never work. I cannot live like that. And it seems you cannot live any other way. I don't think Mary necessarily needs Arthur to live her life, but she cannot live his. Perhaps a healthy middle was the dream for her, but Arthur wasn't willing to make it work. When I'm with you, the world makes sense. More than anything, this line is spoken like someone truly in love. Every time we have seen them together, every time the world makes sense for her, she has apparently spoken from the heart, and her vulnerability makes sense. When we are apart, I see clearly that your world is not a world from which one can escape. Mary can see that Arthur is trapped in a cycle of violence, in a world to which he is indebted and from which he cannot leave. And this leads into one of my favorite lines from the entire game. There's a good man within you, Arthur, but he is wrestling with a giant. Mary knows, perhaps more than most, that Arthur is a good man at his core, but because of the company he keeps, the problems he is tasked with solving, and the people he is bound to protect, he is trapped in a cycle of doing bad things. And the giant wins time and again. And if the giant is beating Arthur, Mary needn't even try. You've broken my heart again, and I fear I have broken yours. Mary did not simply decide not to date Arthur, she decided to end years of deep love and connection because she knew it was ultimately impossible. And in doing so, she is heartbroken. The relationship didn't end, or in this case failed to restart, because of an argument, or infidelity, or betrayal. It ended because it simply cannot work. Because despite the love that they have for each other, it's not enough to solve that problem, or fix that bridge. This is a story of two people who love each other deeply, and in some ways are all too compatible for each other but who cannot or should not be together, and doing so would likely cause more problems and heartbreak further down the line than these two good people deserve. This is the heartbreaking realism of this story for me. It doesn't end with the man getting the woman, if even for a moment. This is a woman who realizes what is best for her, and despite the temptation or apparent simplicity of being with Arthur, of giving in to temptation and being with the man she so clearly loves in so many ways, she makes the incredibly difficult and powerful decision to step away for both their sakes. Because, like life, this is not a fairy tale. This is all too real. To finally step away, Mary returns the ring that he gave her many years ago, and in doing so, she sets herself free, and never speaks to Arthur again. Thankfully, Arthur finally does wrestle with that giant. He takes the suggestion that Mary said to him the last time they met, Run away right now and don't look back. And tell someone he loves to do the same. When the time comes, 
You gotta run and don't look back. Arthur may be unable to give his love to Mary, but that does not mean he has no love to give. In the final effort of his life, he sacrifices himself to save John and his family. He gives his satchel to John with the ring inside, and eight years later, John uses that ring to propose to Abigail. Because love doesn't die when a relationship comes to an end. Both participants still have love to give, and they can and will do so. Whether it's a future loved one, or a friend, or family, one singular relationship does not define a person, it does not define a lifetime. We're all important people living our own lives at our own pace. One person deciding that they're not necessarily interested in being a part of that life, or of you being a part of theirs, is not necessarily a judgement on you as a person, and should not define who you are, what you do, and how much love you can be willing to give. The love that Arthur was unable to give, the love that Mary was unable to accept and give in return, it wasn't for nothing. It found its home, just as we will find ours. What a beautifully poignant and heartwarming love story, after all. <laughs>